Well, good morning, all. Morning. See, you guys are awake. You got the idea now, so that's good. It's good, good to have us here, and uh, boy, you know what? I know we're all just waiting for things to get back to some semblance of normal, but I'm so grateful that we still have these opportunities to get together every Sunday. This is, this is kind of one piece of normal, even though it's not as normal as we'd like. This is one piece of normal, right? During the week, we get to get together with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship the Lord together and spend time studying His Word. And uh, boy, I'm just so grateful for that opportunity that we have right now and continue to pray for uh, things to get better. We're praying for God's hand in the midst of this whole coronavirus and everything else and praying that He will bring about His perfect will and His provision and sustaining grace. And He's certainly worthy of our praise and He's a good Father and He will see us through. Amen. Well, hey, let's take a moment and we'll open with a word of prayer and then we'll turn our attention to the Lord by singing His praises. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we are so grateful to have the freedom and opportunity to gather once again in Your presence. And Lord, to set aside this time that we might lift our hearts to You in praise and seeking Your glory and honor, that we have this time as well to be encouraged encouraged by one another, and certainly encouraged by you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. I pray, God, that you would be active in our midst this morning. Lord, help us to find the freedom in our hearts to praise you, to give you that praise, honor, and glory that you so richly deserve. And Lord, to to be able to step beyond the, the things of this world that concern us day in and day out. May this be a day of emotional and spiritual rest may we find our refreshment in you and we pray god that you would be at the very center of everything we do here from the words we sing to the words we study to the time we enjoy in fellowship together may you god be right at the very middle of it all and we ask your blessing on our time in jesus name amen Well, let's go ahead and stand together, and we are going to sing it out to the Lord, starting with Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. the privilege of receiving forgiveness for our sins through faith in Christ. And it's because of what he did, what he did on the cross, his willingness to take on himself the punishment that we deserve for all of the wrong things that we've ever done. He took that on himself for you, for me, for every person in the history of creation here. He willingly took our punishment on himself so that God could then extend to us freely the offer 
of forgiveness and salvation. And if we would put our faith in Christ, if we would repent of that sin, acknowledging it before God, God says that he will hold that debt paid in full because of what Jesus did. calling is to follow Christ, his leading. He is the one who lays out our path, plans our steps, makes them firm, and ours then is the choice whether we're going to follow his leading or not. So let's make that choice to follow him. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. 
When you move, I'll move. I will follow. seated. I'm, I'm getting better at not asking people what's new. So, not a lot new going on right now, I know. Uh, I imagine, like, like me and my family, you guys are uh, endeavoring to make the most of whatever outings you make, right? I mean, I know my parents, I talk to them each week, and they're like, hey, we went to Costco this week. We got out of the house. You know, it's just big, exciting stuff to get out. Um, for me, I'm, when I'm out, it's usually on two wheels. I'm either on my bicycle or, or one of the motorcycles, and I just, I, I cruise all of the roads around our Santa Maria Valley here and kind of north and south from here. Love kind of getting out and away from things, especially off of the major highways because there's just there's no traffic out there and you can just ride to your heart's content. So, uh, you know, whether it's out Fox and Canyon or you go up or down Highway 1 or you go through Los Alamos or Los Olivos or up to, I don't know, go all the way up to the San Luis Obispo Pier or something like that. One of the things that uh, was kind of interesting, not, not having come from an agricultural area, I grew up down in the LA area and uh, closest thing to agriculture down there, I suppose, was the salad place down on San Fernando Boulevard. But, um, you know, I, it, was, it was kind of astounding to me to see so many 
open areas around here. We do get tractors that drive by on the street in front of our house. I still chuckle at that. It just kind of, wow, that's a real tractor out on the road in front of my house. Uh, there's vineyards everywhere around here. Great place for growing grapes. Uh, vines, as far as the eye can see, many of them have been there for years, I understand. And especially when my, my friends and I on the bicycles were heading out Fox and Canyon, there's just vineyards all over the place out Fox and Canyon. And it doesn't matter what road you decide to take to cross over the hill to the other side, vineyards along every one of those roads. And uh, they're all pretty well in full leaf right now. Uh, but it, it's real interesting to see around oh, the winter, you know, kind of that December, January time, they're all trimmed back, and they look like they're dead because there's one, you know, you got the big root vine coming up out of the ground, and they've got poles and wires, and the, the thing gets up to the wire, and one skinny little stick runs this way, and one skinny little stick runs that way, and there's nothing else on it, and you're like, surely they are not producing grapes this year. And I'll tell you what, three months later, you roll by, and those things have got leaves everywhere and clusters of grapes hanging off of them, and just never ceases to amaze me. Uh, we've seen, actually, there's a few newer vineyards that are going in, so it's been interesting to kind of see their progress over the weeks and months as we ride out in those areas and see them prepare the land, and then they'll kind of get their, their orientation of how they're going to lay things out, and they begin running irrigation and getting the poles and the wires, and then the little plants get in, and they start to grow up. And, uh, but, you know, I, it, it just looks like, well, the new ones look like they're never going to get there, but even the ones that have been there, like I say, when they trim them back every year, you just think there's no way this plant is coming back from that. But they do that on purpose, I'm told, because it actually helps them to produce more and better grapes. I guess grapevines have a tendency to want to just put out branches and leaves, and the more they do that, the less they put out grapes. So they, they trim them back so that the branches that are there are going to put all of their energy into leaving grapes instead of just leaves. Now, you guys well know from your time in the Bible that Jesus had this habit of using things that were in his culture and in his environment to explain uh, biblical ideas, to explain spiritual concepts. He took things that were around people in their everyday life, and he used them to illustrate biblical lessons, spiritual lessons. And that's exactly what he does in our text today as we come into John chapter 15. He speaks very uh, particularly of a vineyard, of a vine, and its branches. Grapes, I, I understand, are, I, I'm not sure if it's one of the most or maybe the most widely grown fruit in the world. Uh, grapes and cultivating grapes and vineyards has been done for literally thousands of years. Matter of fact, archaeological evidence in Egypt shows that people were cultivating vineyards 2,500 years before Christ. Matter of fact, you go all the way back into Genesis there, and what does Noah do when he finally steps off the boat there after being on board for a year? He plants a vineyard. Won't tell you how it went from there. It kind of went south from there, but he planted a vineyard. And, and so this is something that's been going on for uh, just almost next to forever. The main point, and I'm just going to put it out here right up front. Before we even crack open our Bibles to uh, John 15, we're going to be in just the first part of the chapter this morning. I'm going to give you the main point. G the main point that Jesus makes in our text is that we need to remain connected to him. We need to remain connected to him in order to bear spiritual fruit. If we're going to be what God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do, we have to maintain a vital, intimate, life-giving connection with Jesus. And that shakes out in kind of three things in our passage. First of all, we see the, just the kind of straightforward fact that we just need to do the things that Christ has designed us to do. We have been designed with a purpose, and so we need to do those things that, that God has ordained that we do. Secondly, again, this kind of being the main point, we can only do those things as we remain connected to Christ. And then thirdly, we see that God blesses those who remain in close contact with Christ and bear spiritual fruit. So let me invite you to open up your Bibles with me to John chapter 15. If you're not already there uh, in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 15, 
and we're going to just be looking at the first 11 verses of the, of the chapter together this morning, right from the beginning and kind of spread out through these 11 verses, we see this call to do the things that Christ has designed you to do. And he would sum it up in the phrase, bear fruit. You have been designed to bear spiritual fruit, to yield a produce, a crop, a spiritual produce. Take a look at the first three verses of the chapter with me here. Jesus speaking, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. For context, uh, the idea of vine, vineyard, not only is that something that has been done kind of throughout human history, the maintaining of vineyards, but it is an illustration concept that God has used repeatedly throughout his word. You look back into the Old Testament and it is the nation of Israel that is described as a vine or as a vineyard. In passages like Psalm 80, uh, particularly in Isaiah chapter 5, as well as several passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the, the writings, the prophets, they, they picture Israel as God's vine, as his vineyard that he is cultivating, that he prepared for himself, and he is looking to it to bear the fruit that he desired in them. But especially in that passage in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah is being used by God to call Israel out on their failure to bear good fruit. And matter of fact, God through Isaiah says essentially that he is ready to tear down the vineyard. He is ready to tear down the walls and everything that he had built because he only gets bad fruit. Here, Jesus describes himself as the true vine. And, and here we see that kind of juxtaposition with Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. He chose them out of all nations on the earth, raised them up, delivered them from slavery in Egypt, led them into the promised land, and said that through them every nation on earth would one day be blessed, and that's because Jesus himself came from that lineage, and he is the one that God has raised up to be the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who can forgive us for our sins but Israel was originally pictured as that vine, and they, they didn't live up to what God had desired for them. And so as we see Jesus here, the Son of God, the Messiah, he builds himself as, I am the true vine. No longer would it be a question of whether or not we are vines in God's vineyard, like Israel, that maybe we have managed to see our vine planted alongside Israel. It's no longer a question of being in God's vineyard. It's a question of, are you plugged into God's vine, the one true vine? Are you a part of Christ or not? Is he in your life? Are you in his life or are you not? Branches kind of by God's design, they're supposed to bear fruit. That's the whole idea behind having a vineyard. That's the whole reason they prune vineyards. They should bear grapes. And I guess the reality is, is a branch either does or it doesn't. It either bears fruit or it doesn't. The issue here, as Jesus kind of uses this as an illustration, it's not one of quantity, how many grapes, how, how many pounds of grapes. It's not one even of quality. Are they, are they really good grapes? Are they, yeah, I've had better grapes. It's just, is the branch bearing fruit or not? If it is, great. We'll, we'll deal with that. If it's not, then he says that it is to be removed. Things that aren't serving their purpose branches that aren't bearing fruit, they're not doing what they were designed to do. And these unfruitful branches, uh, according to verses 1 and 2, the Father God, being the vine dresser, the gardener, if these branches aren't bearing fruit, then he removes them. He takes them away. 
And down in verse 6, we'll see that not only does he cut them off and take them away, he throws them into the fire. That's a picture of judgment. Fire is used throughout Scripture to symbolize divine judgment. And as a picture, it's a very scary one, very frightening. Because what we see here in verse 2 is that these branches were in Christ. So we need to understand, well, what does that mean? Is he suggesting that we can be saved and somehow lose our salvation and fall out of his favor and grace and, and end up finding ourselves condemned to a Christless eternity? No. What he's saying is that these branches were identified or identified themselves with Christ. So let's talk about what kind of a person Jesus is talking about here. There's one person already that's been presented to us in the Gospel of John that would serve as kind of the poster boy for a branch that was in Christ but bearing no fruit and was removed as the disciple Judas. He was one who had spent three or four years with Jesus as his constant companion. He was one of the 12 disciples. And along with those other 11, they sat under Jesus' teaching. They witnessed his wisdom, his miracles, his authority. They participated with him in ministry, learning from him. And for all intents and purposes, I think Judas appeared to be a follower of Christ like any one of the other disciples, but he wasn't. We find that he was actually a thief. He was the treasurer for the group, but he was helping himself to uh, the, the proceeds that were in their common money box that provided for their needs. Of course, as you well know, he betrayed Jesus to the religious authorities. He may have been in Jesus. He was in Jesus' presence. He, he was following him around, but Jesus was not in him. And Sad to say, there are still people who are like that today. There are people uh, around the world who regularly and faithfully attend church every week, every time the doors are open. They're at church, they're at Bible study. They, they give to support the ministries of the church. They volunteer in ministry and, and help out in areas that, that they're needed. They may live very moral lives. They may show themselves to be very kind people. But none of that is what makes a person a follower of Christ. It's not about the outside. It's not about the things that we do with our time. None of that saves a person. It's, about, it's not about what we do. It's about what's been done for us. It's about what Christ did in dying for the penalty for our sins. And then it's about our connection with Him, our connection with the one true vine. Being a follower of Christ involves a number of things, doesn't it? Partially, it involves a way of thinking. That's doctrine. What do we believe? Are we, are we basing our belief on what God's Word says or not? That's, a, that's our foundation. God has given us his word, the Bible, so that we might know him, that we might know about our sin, that we might know about our need for his forgiveness and salvation, that we might know what he did to offer us that forgiveness and salvation. So partly it's a way of thinking, our doctrine. Being a follower of Christ also is partly a way of living. Our, our ethics, how do we live? How do we talk? What do we do? How is our thought life? Those are all things, especially that who are you when no one's looking kind of thing. That's, that's our way of living. That's a part of being a follower of Christ. But ultimately, it involves having a spiritual connection with Christ. We can know everything about him, everything about his word, and still not have a personal relationship with him. In the same way that you can know 
everything about Formula One cars. You can know every single part and how they're assembled, and you can know every turn on whatever racetrack you're going to, and you can know why they have the, the fin at the angle they have it, and everything that goes into that, and, and you can know the driver and how many races that person has won or lost. But if you're not really in the car, then you're not, you're not a Formula One driver, are you? You're not, you're not actually in it. You know all about it, but you haven't experienced it. It's not just the outward stuff that's important. It's having that inward, life-giving connection to Jesus Christ by faith. That's what truly matters. We need to be connected to the vine. And that's what Christ offers us. He offers us a personal, intimate relationship with himself by faith. So, yes, it's, it's what we think, what we believe, how we behave, but ultimately, we can do those things without ever having that personal relationship with Christ by faith. That is where we need to make sure we've brought things to. Back in our text here in verse 2, uh, those branches that do bear fruit, Jesus says they are helped by the gardener to bear even more fruit. He says, verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the gardener takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And here's something that's really interesting. As you look at verses 2 and 3 there, that word for pruning and the word for cleansing, that you are clean down there in verse 3, they actually kind of come from the same root. Uh, probably you wouldn't translate in verse 3 there, you are already pruned. You would say you're already clean. But you could take it up to verse 2 and say, well, every branch that does bear fruit, the gardener cleanses it. He, which is kind of what pruning is. You're cleansing it of all of those extra, uh, I think they call them sucker vines. They basically, they use up the life of the vine, but they don't actually produce anything. So it's being cleansed of all of that extra stuff that doesn't help the vine to bear fruit. Pruning is essentially cleaning the plant of the har things that are harmful or at least not helpful. <clears throat> now, I'm going to make an assumption here, never having been a plant myself, but I'm going to assume that pruning is not a pleasant process for the plant. You're cutting off parts. It probably, if plants had feelings, I'm sure it would hurt. But it's done not with an eye to, to cause harm. It's done with an eye to help things grow. It helps the plant direct its energies into being more productive. My parents have a, an avocado tree in their backyard, been there ever since they, they bought the house when we moved in, when I was in sixth grade. Um, and nobody in my family has uh, anything in the nature of a green thumb, so, you know, it kind of did its thing, and we kind of did our thing, and then, you know, family enjoyed the avocados that came off of it. And it grew and got kind of unwieldy, and so one year they decided, you know what, it's, it's overhanging the roof, and there had been some roof damage, and so they needed to trim it back. So they hired somebody to come in, and boy, they butchered that tree. I mean, they took it down to seemingly about half of the size it was. And, and we kind of, you know, my thought, and I'm sure my parents as well, was, uh, you know, that's probably it for this tree. Hopefully we'll get enough leaves to provide shade. Do you know we got the most avocados out of that tree that following year than we had ever seen in the history of living in that house? Because it needed to be pruned. It was so big and had so many leaves and so many branches, the energy was just going into sustaining the size of the tree. And when all of that was scaled back, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to blow it out with avocados then. And there were just avocados everywhere. Jesus wants us to bear fruit. That's, that's what he conveys all the way through these 11 verses. But then we need to kind of pull that back and say, okay, we know, I, I don't think Jesus expects me to spontaneously sprout grapes out of my body somewhere. He wants spiritual fruit, got that. What are we talking about, though? What is the spiritual fruit that Jesus is talking about? Well, I, I think it's the kind of fruit that Jesus demonstrated throughout his life. The, the way that he lived, the way that he talked, the way that he loved, the way that he interacted with people, those things that he demonstrated he wants us to live according to that same example. The, the fruit that we should be bearing as believers is the fruit of Christ-likeness, of being like Christ. I'm going to take us out of John here for just a moment over to Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 
and 23. And, and this is not an exhaustive list here. I'll put it up on the screen for you. It's not an exhaustive list, but what it does is it helps us to see kind of a, this, the kind of spiritual fruit that Jesus wants us to bear. So go ahead and there we go. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now look at that list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Can we not see every single one of those things in the life of Christ? Was he loving? Beyond loving. Was there joy in his life? Yes. Joy at fulfilling the calling of his Father, of the Father God. Did he have peace? Yes, even as he faced his crucifixion. Was he patient? Do do you know much about the 12 disciples? Yes, he was patient. He was kind. He was good. He was definitely faithful. He was gentle. And he exercised uh, an incredible amount of self-control when you consider here is God in the flesh being mistreated by the very people that he created, being put to death on a cross when at any moment in power and glory he could have not only come down off of that cross but decimated everything and yet he willingly accepted that for our benefit that we might be offered forgiveness and salvation so we see this fruit in the life of christ and this is the kind of fruit he wants us to bear as well and and we will be able to bear that and we are able to bear this kind of fruit because we are connected with him by faith. As we are a part of that true vine, this is the fruit. Notice singular, it's not the fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. These are the things corporately together that are true of those who have put their faith in Christ. And, and you know, we might do better or worse at it from day to day, but these are the things that God puts in in us. But there's still things that I think can hinder our ability to spiritually bear fruit. Lots of things. And, and I'm going to kind of spell out a few here by way of saying, well, here's what can happen with an a actual grapevine, and what does that look like in our lives? So one thing that can cause a vine not to bear fruit is just lack of proper nourishment. So If there's not a good water supply, if those vineyards are not being regularly watered, they'll wither and and either not produce or or they'll ultimately die. Uh, A a lack of proper nutrients in the soil, those kinds of things can can cause harm to or destroy the vine. That's why Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. We need to find our sustaining, uh, spiritual sustaining grace in Christ. His life, his love, that's what's supposed to flow in and through us as we are connected to him by an intimate relationship of faith. Apart from that, our fruit will be unproductive. We cannot produce the fruit that Christ wants in our lives apart from having that connection with him. Second thing that can cause a lack of fruitfulness in a vine is disease. Insects, uh, diseases of all sorts, you know, that's, that's the things that worry uh, those who uh, manage grape vineyards. They, they can, things can move actually from, you know, you'll have parts of the, uh, of the branches or vines that will die off and, and they'll become infested with bugs. And the thing is, those bugs and that disease can spread from the dead branch to the live branch. And that's, that's part of the reason they cut off the dead branches. They don't want it to cause problems to what's living and healthy. And, and that same thing can take place in our lives as well. When we have ongoing sin in our lives that we just have failed to or refused to address, to bring before the Lord, to confess and to, to repent of, to turn away from, when we have those kind of ongoing things in our lives, when we have unresolved past issues, we, we have refused to try and uh, 
reconcile a relationship, offer forgiveness where it's due, whatever it may be, when we have those things, it leads to spiritual ineffectiveness. We don't bear fruit the way God wants us to. Immature branches are another thing that doesn't produce good fruit. Uh, I'm told that brand new vineyards, like the ones we've been seeing on our rides out in Fox and Canyon, they can take three to five years before they will actually kind of allow the vines to bear grapes. Uh, those immature branches, they just keep pruning them and training and kind of getting that one dominant uh, branch off of each side of the vine, and, and they will allow those young plants to mature to the point where they can sustain the level of growth that's desired. Well, we need time to grow too. Spiritually, we need time to be refined by the Lord, and sometimes that spiritual growth is challenging. Sometimes it's even painful as God confronts us with areas that, that he wants us to be more Christ-like in. It's hard to have those things kind of held up in the mirror to our face and to say, wow, I, I do need to be more mindful of, of gossiping, of my short temper, of, of how I'm treating others or, or the things I'm thinking about or doing or saying. God prunes us. He, he works to help us so that we might bear more fruit. Now, improper pruning, I suppose, would be another way that would keep plants from bearing the kind of fruit they're supposed to. A wise gardener probably knows what branches to remove and how to bring about the most fruitfulness. They, they have learned the way of that vine and are able to help it become everything that it should be. Well, our priorities, our focus, our energies, we need to make sure that those are being directed by Christ. And it's not just me simply living the way that I want to live, but that I'm seeking to live according to God's design, according to God's desire. His word, not my own wisdom, not my own thoughts. A couple more, if there's no gardener, you're not going to probably get much of a, a produce. Uh, vines need constant attention. We've got our, our neighbor over the, the fence there at the parsonage, they've got grapes, uh, a vine growing in their yard, and it's grown over the fence into our yard. I don't know what their side looks like. We don't do much with it, and so it's just kind of wild. There's a lot of leaves and a lot of branches and stuff, and it does put out some grapes, but I'm sure that if it was actually tended the way it was supposed to, it could probably put out a whole bunch of grapes, but there's no gardener on our side of the fence. You know, resistance to God's guidance and his pruning when we say, nope, I'm going to keep doing it my way. I don't, I don't want to know what God wants me to do. I'm content to do it my own way. When we take that kind of an idea and say, no, I, I'm not interested in being pruned. I like my leaves the way they are. That leads to unfruitfulness. And lastly, and probably most obviously, you want to see a branch that's not bearing fruit, just separate it from the vine. Just cut it off. Break it off. It, it may put out some leaves after you break it off. It's not going to be around long. It is not going to be bearing fruit. Branches have to be attached to healthy stock, to that healthy vine in order to bear fruit. And likewise, we need to never let ourselves think for a moment that I'm okay to do it on my own without Christ. I don't need him. I, I can handle this. God, I got this. Don't need your help. I'll call you when I need you. Don't go there. We need his help every minute, every day. He alone is the giver and the sustainer of life. And if you want to bear fruit and if you want to walk in his ways, you will need his help like we all do. All in all, we need to do the things Christ has designed us to do. That's to bear spiritual fruit. But the next thing we see in our passage is that we can only bear spiritual fruit by remaining close to Christ. Take a look at verses 4 through 6 back in our passage in John chapter 15. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. One of the things we need to understand here, this is not a passage about salvation. 
This is a passage about living for Christ. Christ has already talked about salvation a number of points earlier in the Gospel of John. Jesus is not trying to explain how we can be saved. It's not by bearing fruit that we are somehow saved. What he's talking about is our need to remain constantly connected to him, that we will not be able to bear the kind of fruit he wants in our lives if we are not connected to him. That word abide, or in in some English translations of the Bible, shows up also as remain, shows up like 10 times in, in our passage. It's clearly a main idea. A branch must remain connected to the vine, or it will not be able to bear fruit. There's just no two ways about it. The vine is what nourishes and sustains the branch. The vine is what enables it to be productive. As I said, I am not really much of an agricultural guy. Uh, In all honesty, I could probably kill a plastic plant. I just don't have the ability to maintain those sorts of things. But even I look at this and I say, well, that makes sense. You know, if you cut the branch off of the vine, I've seen that. The branch dies. You know, I've seen branches come off of our pine trees here in the parking lot, and they lay on the ground there, and they turn brown, and they're dead because they're no longer connected to the tree. Jesus explained this in, in kind of picturesque terms that people of his day understood. They saw viticulture all around them. There were vineyards everywhere. We live in an area where that's pretty common as well, and so maybe that's a, a good illustration for, for us here in the Santa Maria Valley I don't know, if Jesus was preaching and teaching today, he might use something different that would connect with people in a different way today, trying to use something that's common in our everyday lives. Maybe it would go something more like this. I am the electricity. My father is the one who runs the power company. Every appliance in me that does not work the way it should, every fan that doesn't blow air, every refrigerator that doesn't keep food cold, every microwave that doesn't heat food up, he takes away. And every appliance that works well, he maintains it. He tunes it up and cleans it to make sure that it will be able to continue to do that and even better. You're already in good shape because of the word which I've spoken to you. So remain plugged into me and let my electricity flow into you. As the appliance cannot work of itself unless it's plugged into the outlet, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I'm the electricity. You are the appliances. He who remains in me and I flowing in and through him will be able to do everything that he was designed to do. But apart from me, you won't work at all. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown away as an appliance and and crushed at the recycling center and and then buried to rust. If you abide in me, remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And we could keep going on there, but I I, I think that we need to recognize this idea of connection. We get the electricity part. We got outlets all through the sanctuary here. You charge your cell phones and all your devices, and if the power goes off, man, life just shuts down hard, right? Right? I can't microwave my frozen meal anymore. There's no electricity. That's the picture. We need that intimate connection of Christ flowing in and through us. Apart from that, we can't do anything that we were designed to do. We need to abide. We need to remain in Christ. I think there's a lot of people who try to uh, do it themselves. They, They live to the best of their ability, good lives. They, are, they try to be honest people, trying to do what, what is right. But, but the thing is, is in and of ourselves, we can never do good enough. We can never be right enough. We all fall short. You just, just run through the list of the Ten Commandments if you want a, an exercise in frustration. How many lies have you told? Whew, no, big number. Don't know what the, what the decimal would be on that. Uh, you know, have, have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Have you ever... Have you ever hated someone? Have you ever looked lustfully at another person who was not your spouse? All of these things, the law just shows us how far short we fall and that we can't do it on our own. Jesus says that the only way that we're going to be able to live a good life, a right life, 
is to remain connected to him. To, to be like a branch attached to the vine, because apart from Christ, all of our efforts are unfruitful. Abiding in Christ means believing. It means believing that he is the Son of God. It means trusting in him alone for the forgiveness of our sins, not him mostly and my good works, you know, as kind of that added little kick to make sure that I make it all the way there, to, to enter into that spiritual relationship in which he comes to dwell by his Holy Spirit within us. That is what it means to abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ naturally leads to obedience, doing the things that God calls us to do, and it means that we will continue to believe his word. We can only bear spiritual fruit by remaining close to Christ. And with the remainder of the paragraph, then, Jesus shows us that God blesses those who remain close to Christ and bear spiritual fruit. Pick up in verse 7 with me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. There's four blessings that show up in these final verses of the paragraph here as a result of bearing fruit the way God intended. First, there's the blessing of answered prayer up there in verse 7. If we may remain in Christ and his words remain in us, we will see our prayers answered. Now, back in the last chapter, in John chapter 14 and verse 13, Jesus said something similar. He talked about praying in his name to receive whatever we ask for. And as we studied that verse some weeks ago, we, we agreed that he's not basically giving us a magic formula that as long as you tack in Jesus' name onto the end of your prayer, you can magically get whatever you want. That's not the kind of prayer life that God desires in us. And, and this verse here operates under the same limitations as that previous one. If we are abiding in Christ and if his words are abiding in us, if his commands are centered in our hearts, then that kind of automatically limits the validity of whatever we might pray about. There's no use praying for something that God has already said in his word. Nope, that's bad for you. You shouldn't do that. Well, don't bother praying about it and asking him if it's okay. He's already given you his answer. If, on the other hand, I am praying in accordance with God's word and in accordance with his will, then what Jesus says here is you can be absolutely 100% certain that God will do it because it fits with his purpose and his will for you. Second blessing in our passage here is that we can actually glorify God by the things that we do in verse 8. God prunes us. He disciplines us to help us become more fruitful. And then as we bear fruit, that fruit of Christ-likeness in our lives, God is glorified by that. God is honored by that. And it shows that we are truly disciples of Christ. We are followers of Christ. We are living the way he has called us to live. The third blessing that we see there is that we can find, we can, that we can live in Christ's love. Verses 9 and 10, once again, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Love is that relationship that unites the branch with the vine. It is that which helps us to become the, the followers of Christ that he wants us to be. The love of the Father given to the Son, the love of the Son being passed on then by Jesus to his followers, and we're to remain in that love. We are to live in that love. We live in a relationship of love with our Savior, and that naturally will result in a measure of obedience. We'll do the things that he calls us to do because we love him, because we want to do those things, because we know it pleases him. It's the same way it works in the rest of our lives, doesn't it? If you love maybe a, a member of your family, spouse, kids, parents, whatever, you do things from time to time at least that you know makes that person happy. 
And you don't do it because you have to, you do it because you want to, because you love that person and you enjoy bringing that person a, a measure of joy themselves. You even do it with your stuff. I mean, maybe you really like your car. Well, if you really like your car, I'll bet you probably change the oil and you wash it and you take care of it. You know, or whatever other toys you have, or, or, or maybe it's your garden. You tend it, you weed it, you water it, and you, you prune it. You know, we, we invest in those things that we love, and we do it not because necessarily we have to, but because we want to, because we want to express that love. Living a life of obedience to Jesus helps us to remain in his love. It helps us to be mindful of doing things that demonstrate our love for him. And then finally there in verse 11, there's the blessing of living with Christ's joy. Jesus offers us the fullness of joy. Nothing else in this entire world can bring you the same kind of joy that you can find by living in a right relationship with God through faith in Christ as you serve, abide in, and love and obey Christ, you will find there is a joy that is unmatched by anything else. Back in the previous chapter, Jesus spoke, you remember, of giving his followers his peace. He said, my peace I leave with you. Not just I'm going to help you guys feel at peace, but he was going to leave his own peace with his disciples. And it's the same thing here in verse 11. It's my joy that he leaves. He says, I am leaving you my peace joy. Not just human happiness, not just good times. It's that true joy, that deep satisfaction that can only come to our souls through a right relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. And that results in living our lives for Him, remaining closely connected to Him in the things that we say, think, and do. So here's the question to kind of close us out then. Are you attached are you attached? As a branch, are you a part of the true vine? Jesus wants us to remain connected to him so that we might bear spiritual fruit. He's got great plans for you. He wants to be at work in you and through you. He wants all of us to bear much fruit. And it's not a matter, again, of how much fruit you bear, nor it's not the the color, the size, the quantity of the bunches of grapes, it's are you bearing fruit? God wants us to bear fruit. It's just a matter of is there fruit or isn't there? And if you are a part of the true vine, if you have that relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, then I guarantee you, big or small, there is fruit because God himself says that's what comes from being connected to Christ. So, is your life bringing glory to God? Are you, are you able to be looked at as an example to others of, hey, this is what it looks like to have that relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We must remain connected to Christ if we're going to bear spiritual fruit. Let's close in prayer. God, we, we do acknowledge that, Lord, on our own, we can't do much uh, certainly not anything near enough to, to save ourselves. We, we can't even really do all that many good things for you. We can't bear the kind of fruit that you want us to bear if we're not connected to Christ. But by virtue of that connection, God, we can bear much fruit, fruit that we probably couldn't even imagine otherwise. But, Lord, that's what you do in and through us by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be mindful of how we can just make sure that we're connected, that we can live our lives with a desire to glorify you and honor you, to bear fruit, Lord, in keeping with the faith that we profess. Help us to do the things we do to your glory. And God, we look forward to your return, but until that day, help us to be found faithful living our lives for you in light of the love you have demonstrated towards us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us and let's close our time together with the chorus, Even So.
come. waiting for the Lord's return. And until that day, we need to be about the business of bearing fruit, remaining connected and seeking to live the lives that he's called us to live. I pray that this ends up being a good week for you. Whatever it looks like, that it's good because God is in it and God is with you. We still have our uh, afternoon uh, fellowship online, uh, Zoom fellowship. How many of you guys are getting the church email each week, like Thursday, Friday? So the link is in there. Uh, if you haven't been on, see if you can make time to join us today. Uh, former family, 
from our church who moved to Michigan a number of years ago, has kind of reconnected with our church online, and uh, they're going to be joining us this afternoon at 1 o'clock and hoping to see some familiar faces and be able to catch up with some folks. So see if you can make the opportunity, make the time to join us at 1 o'clock. You'll find the, the link for that, that Zoom fellowship in your church email from this past week, all right? Well, God bless you guys, and I will look forward to the nearest moment that we can gather again and worship the Lord together. Have a good week.